chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. We're going to start reading in verse 22 the preceding verses and uh, the events uh, surrounding these scriptures that uh, the events these scriptures describe is that Moses has just brought the children of Israel through the Red Sea where the waters parted and they came across on dry ground. Pharaoh's army chased in uh, to the parted Red Sea after them and the waters came back together and destroyed the most powerful military force on the face of the earth without Israel even having to throw a rock. And following that, it tells us about Israel's song of deliverance. Miriam, Moses' sister, is moved on by the Holy Ghost and they sing a song of deliverance. And then immediately following that, it tells us in verse 22. We'll start reading in Exodus 15, verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And there they went there three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. There's uh, no way to tell really from the language whether it's talking about just bad taste or if it's poisonous. Uh, some Bible scholars, maybe the majority of them, lean toward poisonous, but we really don't know. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Now, folks, you know as well as I do, that's not the natural reaction to a tree being thrown into water. Obviously, clearly this is a supernatural event. It's God performing a miracle for his people that he's just brought out of Egypt, the bondage of Egypt, and delivered them. So Moses cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Here's an unchanging law. It's a law given of God, and because it's given of God and God never changes, it's an unchanging law. That's what statute and ordinance means. It means it's an unchanging law. So here's what it is. God said, verse 26, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that heedeth thee. Now we always have to make this comment, and we invite you to check this out. Don't just take my word for it. There's uh, plenty of sources, a lot of online sources and resources that you can get this information from. But the Hebrew language has a permissive verb that, that doesn't translate very well into the English. And that's why, or maybe at least one reason why, in many cases, particularly in the Old Testament, the translators, the King James translators, translates it as God is doing these things. Now, the, the language doesn't always support it. The language doesn't always disprove it. In some cases, it will. But the reality is the translators thought that God was making everything happen that happened. And that's not too different from a lot of the attitude of the modern day church. A lot of the church doesn't know whether God's making people sick. They know that he can and has the power to, to, uh, to heal the sick. But they never think through long enough to realize that if God ever wanted somebody sick, he'd be violating his own will to heal them. And God never changes. So here where it says, I will put none of the diseases upon thee that I put upon the Egyptians. Unless he's just talking about the, um, the plagues, then he must be talking about just the results of disobedience and walking in the world without protection. Sickness is always of the devil. You may remember Hebrew, uh, um, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, where Peter said, speaking to Cornelius' household, after being supernaturally summoned to tell Cornelius' household about Jesus, he said, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost in power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now, folks, if healing was good in Jesus' ministry, then how can God, who is always good, who only does good, how can God possibly make anybody sick? There's no way that any Bible scholar, anybody with any understanding of God whatsoever, can legitimately claim that God wants some people sick and he wants some people healed or well. The Bible said God is no respecter of persons. So if he's no respecter of persons, he can't want a different thing concerning sickness and disease for two different people. He's either all on the side of healing and deliverance, or he's all on the side of sickness and disease. So here where it's talking about when it says, when God says 
to and through Moses that he will put none of the diseases upon Israel that he's brought upon the Egyptians. He can't be saying that he's the one that makes the Egyptians sick. It would be, char- it would be counter to his character and his nature. And here's another question. If God wants to make somebody sick, where's he going to get the sickness? There's none in heaven. And there was none created on the earth in the first six days of creation when the Bible says God made an end. After those six days of everything he created, God made an end of all of his creative works. So unless sickness and disease were created in one of those first six days, it cannot, under any circumstances, be of God. Well, the Bible tells us specifically what he did in those first six days. And there was no sickness or disease created in, in any of those de- on any of those days. By the time he finishes his creative works, at the end of the sixth day, he looks at everything and says it's very good. Well, the very good condition he pronounces over the earth is a sickness-free earth. So where would God get sickness if he wanted to make somebody sick? He'd have to get it from the devil, wouldn't he? Does anybody really think that God and the devil are working together? I know a lot of things that the devil does are ascribed to God. But does anybody legitimately think, really think, that God would use the devil's tool, sickness, to bring against his own people? Well, that just doesn't make sense. You can't believe God is who he says he is if you come up with that idea. So here where it says, I'll put none of the diseases upon thee. He's literally saying, I will not allow any of the diseases upon thee that Egypt and the rest of the world knows about. They've been in Egypt. Israel has been in Egypt for 430 years. So about the only thing they know of the world is Egypt. So he's just talking about the sickness that is present in the world and comes upon mankind. So here's the ordinance, the unchanging law. He said, if you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, And will do that which is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will allow none of these diseases upon thee which have come upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now you see this word healeth. It's an interesting word. It's always used and only used. Talking about deliverance from physical ailments. Never in the Old Testament is this word used to talk about doing something for the spirit of man. Or within the spirit of man. Never does it talk about some healing or restorative work. On the inside. It's always, always, always used concerning sickness and disease in the body. But there's something else that's interesting about this word healing. Or healeth. And that is it's a continuous action word. It's in the perfect tense. Which means it's continuous action. So it literally says, I am the Lord that healeth thee, past, present, and future. Now, the only evidence that we have that he might have shown his healing power is when the night of the Passover was upon them. God gave Moses instruction to tell the children of Israel about how to prepare the Passover, to put the blood of the animal over the doorposts and the side posts of the door. He told them, Specifically how to take the lamb and prepare the lamb to roast it in the fire and to eat all of it for the physical benefits that it would provide. Well, the very next day after the firstborn of all of Egypt was killed and destroyed, including Pharaoh's son, it says that Pharaoh drove them out. He finally relented, told them to go, and he drove them out. And the Bible says in Psalm, what is it, Psalm 105? It says they came forth with silver and gold and there was not one people among them. Well, folks, for a people of two to eight million people, that's a pretty big population. Remember, this population has been in slavery all of their lives. And so to imagine that they would be well or uh, free from sickness and disease, nobody would be sick on their own is a pretty big stretch, isn't it? How could you gather together a group of millions whether it's 2 million or 8 million, depending on whose estimates you want to believe. How could you get a crowd of that number and not have anybody subject to sickness or disease? Well, it's possible. We can't prove it. I believe this is the case, but it's possible, certainly, that we have to consider. Since he uses a word for healing that, for, that concerns and, and um, applies to past, present, and future, 
he could very well be saying, I'm the one that brought you healing through the Passover. That wouldn't be far-fetched because the Bible tells us on two other occasions that when Israel offered the Passover, that God healed the sick in their midst. It happened once during Hezekiah's day. And Hezekiah didn't even keep it strictly. They had, Israel had given up on the Passover ritual. And when he found it in the Word, he had one of the, the uh, scribes come and read the Word to him. And when he saw these things in Moses' day about the Passover, he realized that Israel had failed in its commitment or its remembrance of God. So he instructed for the Passover to be kept. And even though they did it at the wrong time, even though they hadn't prepared themselves and sanctified themselves in the proper and appropriate way that God had commanded Moses, the Bible says that through the Passover, God healed the people. So that certainly happens at other points in time. Whether it happened here with Egypt or not, we can't be exactly sure. I'm of the opinion that, it, that that's part of what he's saying. But whether that's the case or not, we know one thing for certain. And that is, he says, God says, I am the Lord that continuously, continuously healeth thee. Now, if that's what God says about himself, how do people in the modern day church get away with thinking or their claim, their preaching, that God doesn't heal today like he used to? Well, what changed? God sure didn't change. God cannot. Again, he commanded them and he gave them a statute and an ordinance, which means he's putting his own name on the line. And he calls himself, he identifies himself as the God that continuously healeth thee. Past, present, and future. Past, present, and future. Turn with me to Isaiah 53. We're going to start in verse 1. This is the beginning of the Messianic chapter. By that, I simply mean that all Bible scholars agree that this chapter in Isaiah 53 identifies the work of the Messiah that was to come, for them that was to come. Of course, we're after Jesus already made his sacrifice. But these words were given by God, by the inspiration of God to Isaiah before, hundreds of years before Jesus came on the scene to fulfill the work. So God is telling them through the prophet, his spokesman, He's telling Israel just exactly what his son, his sacrifice would do. Verse 1, who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now, folks, I know this is a little innocuous and we don't usually start thinking about what the Bible is instructing us or how to believe God. But notice verse 1. It's usually down further in the chapter, several verses down in the chapter before we really start thinking about the instruction that he's giving us. But verse 1 is instructive, too. He says the one whose arm of the Lord, who the arm of the Lord will be revealed to. In other words, the one that will experience the power of God in all of these things that the Messiah will bring about is the one who believes the report. Who hath believed his report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord extended toward? Who hath believed our report? He's talking about faith. He's telling us that faith is necessary. Who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him. He's talking about Jesus before God. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire of him. He's talking about Jesus on the cross. He's saying the sacrifice isn't going to be the way you think that it will. He's saying the Messiah, the work of the Messiah, the finished work of the Messiah will not be something that you imagine it to be. It's going to be different. It's going to be ugly. The Bible says eyewitness accounts as referred to in the Gospels tell us that Jesus' visage was so marred that he didn't even look human. Well, folks, that wasn't just the beating in Pilate's court that did that. Certainly that would have added to it and contributed but when Jesus was made sin for us, when the whole of man's sins were placed on Jesus, it had such an effect on his body that he didn't look human. Remember when the Old Testament, num the, uh, Numbers chapter 21, I believe it is, where the children of Israel had disobeyed God and snakes had come into the camp. Then they repented and they said to Moses, we murmured against God and we murmured against you. 
It's our fault. We know we did wrong. At least they were catching on. But help us because many, many people had died from these poisonous snake bites. You remember what God told uh, Moses to do? He said, put a serpent of brass on the pole. Jesus identified with that serpent of brass in John chapter 3 when he's talking to Nicodemus about the new birth. He said, as the Son of Man, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up from the earth. Jesus is identifying himself with that symbol of the snake, the brass serpent on the pole. When Jesus was made sin, that's what that brass serpent signified. When Jesus was made sin and had the sins of all mankind laid on him, but not put on like a coat, but when it was laid on him, on his spirit, on, on the real him, it had such a damaging effect and an altering effect on his body that it didn't even look human on the cross. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Folks, Jesus' substitutionary work for you and me that took upon himself the sins of mankind, the sicknesses of mankind, the curse that was upon mankind, it was an ugly, ugly thing. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. See those two words, sorrows and grief? Sorrows mean sicknesses and grief means pains. Those words are translated sor uh, sicknesses and pains in other places in the Old Testament. It seems to me, I, I can't come up with another explanation for it, but it seems to me that the translators came upon something that they just could not accept to be true. And so they used words that would tone down the real meaning of these things. Now, I don't think they were bad people. But in the day that they were translating this Hebrew language into the English language, nobody was out there preaching and teaching that Jesus was the healer and that, that sickness and disease was a part of the price he paid. That would have been so foreign to the dominant thought especially of the upper echelon of society who commissioned these things to be translated into English. So they punted the ball, basically. They used words that didn't convey the real meaning. But thank God, with the advent of technology and the ability that we have to research these things, we can find out the meaning of the Hebrew words themselves and see how close they were. And the meaning of these Hebrew words are sickness and pains. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sicknesses and acquainted with pains. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely, notice the word surely there. It's the only verse. Verse 4 is the only verse where surely is mentioned in this chapter. And notice the context that he mentions it. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Again, these are, this is a, these are the same two words, sicknesses and pains. And the two words talking about what he did regarding sickness and pains are two Levitical terms, born and carried. It means to carry a burden away, to lift a burden up and to carry it away, never to return. These are terms that were used concerning the scapegoat in Israel where the sins of the people were pronounced by the high priest upon this goat. The high priest would lay his hands on the head of this goat and symbolically transfer all of Israel's sins to that animal who then would be led into the wilderness uh, to a place where the Bible identifies as a land cut off from the living, which is the same terminology that is used for Jesus paying the price for us after his death in the lower parts of the earth. So the same substitutionary work that is conveyed by these two words, born and carried, regarding sins, and that's later on in this same chapter, this same chapter will identify that Jesus bore our sins and carried away our iniquities, just like it says he bore sicknesses and pains. Just exactly the same. Someone once said there seems to be a parallel track between the price Jesus paid for sin and the price he paid for sickness and disease. And folks, I would submit to you it's not a parallel track. They tried to describe it as, a, as train tracks where you've got two rails. But it's not two rails. It's the same rail. It's the same work that was done 
by virtue of the, the sacrifice of the precious blood of Jesus. Surely, truly, absolutely, certainly, he has borne our griefs, sicknesses, and carried our sorrows, our pains, our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Notice the four things that the Bible says Jesus shed his blood for. Transgressions, iniquities, the chastisement of our peace, and healing. This word peace is the Hebrew word shalom. It means well-meaning in every area, well-being in every area. It's sometimes translated prosperity. It's talking about Jesus paying a price to lift the curse that came on the earth, that made the earth resistant to mankind where before the fall in the Garden of Eden, the earth automatically produced for mankind who had been given authority over this earth. So Jesus paid a price for that too. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, literally bruised, he was so severely beaten that you couldn't see one mark separate from another. If he had been beaten in such a way that there were just stripes on his back, then the Hebrew language would have dictated enough, another word, a different word, to portray that accurately. But the word that's used means that he, was, he was beaten so severely that you could not distinguish one mark from another. There were places where his flesh was ripped off. Some people will say, or some people have said, that healing for the physical body is a small matter when it comes to the forgiveness of sins that they identify with in salvation. But folks, the, pro the price Jesus paid, the punishment that was laid on him by the Roman soldiers in Pilate's court, it was so severe that I don't know anybody, how anybody could say that the shedding of Jesus' blood was in any way insignificant or for any result. So notice what the Bible says. Just as Jesus or God identified himself in, I, in Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord that continuously healeth thee. How is he going to bring healing to the body of Christ? How is he going to bring healing to his family? Well, Isaiah said that continuous healing would be through the sacrifice of the Messiah. Thank God that sacrifice was made. Now, I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 7. This is a kind of a long story, and I apologize for that in advance, but let's start in the beginning of it to see what he's saying. Let's begin in verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. He asked Jesus to his house. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears. And did wipe them with the hairs of her head. And kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it. He spake within himself saying this man if he were a prophet. Would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him. For she is a sinner. Folks she was probably a prostitute. Many people think that this was Mary Magdalene. And Jesus answering verse 40. Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have something to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. Jesus said, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them should love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And Jesus answered, thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into your house, and thou gavest me no water for my feet, a sign of hospitality. But she has washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, no welcome, 
But this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou did not anoint. Again, that was a matter of hospitality. But this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto her, her sins, wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, talking to the woman, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? Now notice the word also. They know about the miracles. They know about the healings. They know about all the things that we have written in the Gospels and maybe more. Maybe things that weren't written and, and uh, put down or added to the Gospels. So they know at least as much as we know about what Jesus has done, probably more. So they said, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. See that phrase, thy faith has saved thee? The word save there is the word sozo. There are two main words that are used for saved or salvation in the New Testament. And those two words have basically the same meaning. There's a shade of difference between the two, but it's getting into the weeds to talk about what the difference is. One is sozo and the other is soterio, but they both come from the same root word. So here where it talks about salvation in the New Testament, words that, uh, that are translated saved or saved or salvation, those words, whether they be sozo or soterio, is talking about the totality of what Jesus paid the price for. Now we just read in Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5, that Jesus died for sins and transgressions, iniquity and transgressions. The only difference between those two is one was the original sin, the sin of Adam that Jesus paid the price for, and the other was the sins of the individual. And then the third thing that he paid the price for was the chastisement of our peace, which was upon him. We talked about that just a, uh, briefly a moment or two ago, where the curse of the earth was lifted off the people of God to those that believe the report. And then the fourth thing, that Jesus paid the price for, the fourth thing that he shed his blood for was healing from sickness and disease. So this word soterio or this word sozo, whichever word is used, has the impact of talking about the, the fullness of what Jesus paid the price for. And so the word used, the word chosen, whether it's either one of those, sozo or soterio, those words identify rescue, deliverance, safety, soundness, and healing. The Greek words themselves that were chosen to use to define salvation carries all of those meanings. Now, which one of those things, if it means those five things, which one of those five things should be translated in each case? Well, it depends on the context in which it's used. So here where it says, Jesus said, thy faith has saved thee. He's literally saying, thy faith has sozoed thee. Well, the context we have just read is talking about the forgiveness of sins. So that word used here, saved, we would well understand. In the Greek, it's literally, the faith of thee has saved thee. In other words, the faith of thee has brought forgiveness of sins. Your sins are forgiven. But now I want, you to show, I want you to see another place where it's used. Turn with me to, to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, we'll start in verse 43. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all of her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind Jesus and touched the border of his garment, and immediately the issue of her blood stanched or stopped flowing. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronging thee, and pressed thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody has touched me, for I perceive that this virtue has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she touched him, and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace. This is exactly the same phrase as we just looked at in chapter 7. 
the faith of thee has sozoed thee. Well, well, the context here is talking about healing from sickness and disease. So here where he says, thy faith has made thee whole. It's translated, the faith of thee has made thee whole. Same word, same action, just as easy for Jesus to heal sickness and disease by the will of God as it is to forgive sins by the will of God. But notice this, notice it's the same faith. It's not a different faith. See, folks, faith is the same in every realm, in every aspect. It's just a matter of what you point your faith toward. And when I use faith in that sense, I'm talking about what you choose to reach out and take hold of. Now, we all know that faith is necessary for what the church world calls salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 is very clear. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God. So by grace are you saved. This is the same word for salvation. One of the two words, either sozo or soterio. By faith are you rescued, delivered, made safe, made sound, and made whole. And the Bible identifies and credits over and over and over again the individual's faith to bring about the results. You remember Matthew chapter 8 where the leper comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I believe you can make me whole if you will. And Jesus said, I will. Be thou cleansed. And immediately his, re his leprosy was cleansed. Well, he had faith to be healed if he could identify the will of God for his life and for his body. When Jesus clears that up, his faith is in a position to take hold of everything that God had for him. And so his leprosy was cleansed instantly. Later on in Matthew chapter 8, it talks about the centurion. Word comes to Jesus that the centurion's servant is sick. Jesus starts on his way to their house. The centurion stops him and says, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. Just speak the word only and my servant will be healed. And then he says, because I'm a man under authority, I understand how authority works. When I tell those under me to go do something, they do it. When my superiors tell me to do something, I do it. So I understand authority. I understand that sickness and disease is under your authority. So just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus marvels. You remember what he said to him? He said, I've not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. The faith of thee has saved thee. The faith of thee has healed thee. Now I want you to look with me to one final scripture. And that's over in James chapter 5. James chapter 5, we'll start reading in verse 14. It says, Is any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church and let him pray over them. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. This word save is the word sozo. Now, what should it be translated as? What English word should it be translated as? Since we know the context of sickness and disease. It should be healed. And the prayer of faith shall heal the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he's committed sins they shall be forgiven him. Now a lot of people get caught up with the elders and the oil. The anointing with oil. But notice in verse 15. That it's not the elders that save or heal the sick. And healing is being saved from sickness isn't it? It's not the elders that the, is the important thing. It's not even the anointing with oil that's the important thing. It says it's the prayer of faith that heals the sick. It's the prayer of faith that heals the sick. Now this is way after this letter that James wrote to the church is way after the early days of the church. We know that Jesus was crucified and resurrected somewhere around 33 A.D. We know that the church was born that same year we know most probably that it was that year, depending on how the calendar fell, it was 33 A.D., maybe 34 A.D., just depending on, like I said, how these events fell according to the calendar. But we know it was one of those two years when Acts chapter 3 took place, where the man at the beautiful gate was healed. We know other things that the Bible says about the healing power of God. It became such a, uh, a powerful thing a powerful part of the preaching of the gospel that people were healed even by Peter's shadow falling across them. 
The Bible tells us story after story about the raising of the dead even and the healing of the sick that proved that the name of Jesus had power over sickness and disease when used by the church just like Jesus had power over sickness and disease when he was here on the earth. But you know as well as I do that a lot of the church has come to the opinion that healing passed away with the last apostle. But let me read some things to you. I want you to hear some things from an historical perspective about healing and, and deliverance in the church age. Justin Martyr wrote in 165 A.D. He was one of the great leaders and scholars of his day. He said, For numberless demoniacs throughout the whole world and in your city, many of our Christian men exercising them in the name of Jesus Christ who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, have been healed and are performing healings in, that, in his present day. Rendering helpless and driving the possessing devils out of the men, though they could not be cured by all the other exorcists and those who used incantations and drugs. Again, something that was written. Well, we know, let me make this statement. We know, therefore, that the healing power of God was at work in the church from the historical records of 165 A.D. That would be 60 years after, a minimum of 60 years after the last apostle died. The last apostle that died would have been John. We know he lived to about age 100. We know he wrote the epistles that, I mean, the gospel that bears his name and the book of Revelation in probably 94, 95 A.D. So 60, 165 A.D. would be anywhere from 65 to 70 years after that. Irenaeus in 200 A.D., he was another one of the early church fathers, wrote this. Those who are in truth his disciples, receiving grace from him, do in his name perform miracles, and they do truly cast out devils. Others still heal, by, heal the sick by laying their hands upon them, and they are made whole. Yea, moreover, as I have said, the dead even have been raised up and remained among us for many years. We never think about people being raised from the dead sticking around for a long time, do we? That'd be a pretty good introduction to your church. Here's brother so-and-so. He was raised from the dead 50 years ago. So at least to 200 A.D., the same apostolic miracle working power was in the church. Origen, another one of the early church fathers, wrote in 250 A.D., 50 years later, and some give evidence of their having received through their faith a marvelous power by cures which they perform, invoking no other name over these who need their help than that of the God of all things and of Jesus, along with the mention of his history. In other words, they preached that Jesus healed when he was here on the earth, so they could continue his healing work today, in their day. For by these means, we too have seen many persons freed from grievous calamities and from distractions of mind and madness and countless other ills which could not be cured either by men or devils. So we know that the healing power of God was still working in the church by 250 A.D., A long time after the last apostle died. Here's what Clement said. Another early church father in 275 A.D. Let them, speaking of the young ministers, therefore with fasting and prayer, make their intercessions and not with the well-arranged and fitly ordered words of learning, but as men who have received the gift of healing confidently to the glory of God. He goes on to say the miraculous gifts continued through the third century at least. Then he tells how under Constantine, the church became flooded with worldliness and began to put its trust in earthly rulers more than in God. But even those who remained true to God saw the miracles performed in his name. One of the early church historians in 429 A.D. said this, or wrote this, Many heathen among us are being healed by Christians from whatever sickness they have. So abundant are miracles in our midst. There's a fellow named Zinzendorf in Germany that was a very famous man, very famous minister of the gospel. 
And it is said of his words that were written in 730, 1730, excuse me. He said, to believe against hope is the root of the gift of miracles. And I owe this testimony to our beloved church that apostolic powers were there manifested. We have had undeniable proofs thereof in this unequivocal discovery of things, persons, and circumstances which could not have humanly been discovered in the healing of maladies in themselves, incurable, such as cancers, consumptions, when the patient was in the agonies of death by all means of prayer or of a single word. So in 1730, miracles were still happening in the church. Dr. A.J. Gordon, in his classic book, Ministry of Healing, on page 65, quotes about those in church history. Therefore, concerning the anointing of the sick, we hold it as an article of faith and profess sincerely from the heart that sick persons, when they ask it, may lawfully be anointed with oil, by one who joins with them in praying that it may be efficacious to the healing of their body, according to the design and end and effect mentioned by the apostles. And we profess that such an anointing performed according to the apostolic design and practice will be healing and profitable. He continues to say in his book, Ministry of Healing, two streams of blessings started from the personal ministry of our Lord, a stream of healing and a, spring of, a stream of regeneration, the one for the recovery of the body and the other for the recovery of the soul. And these two flowed on side, and flowed on side by side through the apostolic age. It is quite reasonable to suppose that the purpose of God was that one should run on through the whole dispensation of the Spirit and that the other should fade away as utterly, and utterly disappear within a single generation. We think not. In other words, he's saying, though some may preach and some may believe that healing stopped, it's just as, a, as an effective stream of God's work as the salvation of the soul. Folks, there are many, many others. There are many historical accounts. We could stay all night and not exhaust, exhaust the testimonies and declarations of faith in the healing power of God from people that witnessed it in different stages in different times of the church but the reality is simply this how could something possibly pass away when Jesus shed his blood for it how could God be anything other than the Lord that healeth thee continuously when that's what he declared his name to be one of his names but certainly one of his redemptive names Healing has always been a part of the church and it always will. Let me remind you again of James chapter 5. Is any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church and let them, the elders, pray over them, the sick, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The prayer of faith shall save or heal the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. Now, focus on that phrase for a minute. The Lord shall raise him up. That sounds a lot to me like I am the Lord that continuously healeth thee. See, in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, where it says, If the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he'll quicken your mortal body. That's the healing work of God, the continuous healing work of God that's available to us when we reach out in faith and lay claim to it. So it's the prayer of faith that heals the sick. And the Lord shall raise them up. And if they've committed sins, they will be forgiven them. I love how James is inspired by the Holy Ghost to say, even if sin on your part is part of the problem, it should not be a deterrent to receiving your healing. Because God's bigger than that. The same prayer of faith that heals the sick forgives the sin that may have been the cause of sickness. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. The prayer of faith always works, folks. Who of us would ever say if somebody came to the altar and extended their faith to receive salvation, to receive the new birth? Who of us would ever say that that would not or could not or did not work for them? I certainly wouldn't, would you? A person's faith extended toward the new birth is between them and God. 
And we can say and do say and should say with the utmost confidence that if someone turns their heart to the Lord, in other words, reaches out for the salvation that Jesus purchased and paid for, they will be born again. Then why would we think that it would be different with sickness and disease, healing from sickness and disease, when Jesus shed the same blood and requires only the same extension of faith from the heart to take hold of? It's just as sure. It's just as true. Let's all stand together. I want to lead you in a confession. Because it's the prayer of faith that saves the sick. Jesus said about that prayer of faith in Mark chapter 11 verse 24. Therefore I say unto you what things soever you desire. Well healing's a desire isn't it? What things soever you desire. When you pray believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So the prayer of faith that heals the sick is the prayer of faith that says I have it when I pray. I lay hold of it. Because of the word of God and the truth of God's word. I lay hold of it by faith according to God's word. And the Bible identifies, the Holy Ghost guarantees that that faith extended through, faith, through prayer always heals the sick. So close your eyes and say this after me. I believe God's word. I believe that Jesus paid the price for sin and sickness. And by faith, I believe that I receive my healing right now because Jesus paid for it, because he is my healer, because the quickening power of the Holy Ghost brings continuous healing to my body. I declare that the Lord is now raising me up and restoring me to divine health. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, folks, if you said that from your heart and hold fast to it, the devil's not big enough to keep it from happening for you and me. He has no power to stop it. You've got God's eternal word on it. Amen. Say it again after me. I believe I received my healing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, folks. Thanks for being with us.